But how do you have principal debates among family? Would you just tell people, avoid them altogether? It's what a lot of people would say. It's probably, might be the advice I would give. I'm curious how those conversations around principles, uh, what advice and, and how did you navigate them? I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is I had the distinct advantage, as you alluded to, of being a teenager when most <laughs> of this was going on. So the level of sort of shame that I had or didn't have and confidence that I had or didn't have is not what I would describe as existing even when I was in my mid twenties. So, I mean, initially there was a lot of sort of, well, I'm right and you're wrong. And the great unearned confidence of our teenage years. What right. a wonderful right. time to be alive. I mean, I, I, I did have, I mean, dad uh, alluded to this briefly before, Dad and I did have conversations. And I, I think, look, we were a household where we debated a lot of things. You know, my, my brother is an attorney. I thought I might be an attorney. You know, around the dinner table was a place where we debated politics. We debated education. We talked about Israel. So the idea that, you know, we couldn't have a conversation about a controversial issue just never would have occurred to me or to anyone else in our immediate family. So and with my father in particular, we tended to have a lot of these sort of conversations, arguments, debates, whatever you want to call them. And for this had been for a lot of my life, it just sort of changed slightly the degree. But my sort of statements that there has to be like, there has to be a final answer, there has to be a right answer, there has to be a standard. And, you know, I understand that you love mitzvot, but like you pick this mitzvah and I pick that mitzvah, like it, how can you have a community like that? How can you have, you know, a religion like that? There just have to be minimum standards that everybody follows was a, a sense I had kind of for my whole life, but really crystallized for me in my teenage years when I was on this journey. And, you know, then my father would, would sort of talk about why he didn't think that was necessarily the case. And I, I mean, I remember those conversations as not being any more contentious than, you know, some political conversations we had or some Israel related conversations that we had. I think, you know, with my mother, as my father pointed out, the, the practical issues were more of an issue. And I didn't, of course, I didn't want to make her feel like her home wasn't kosher in some sort of absolute sense. But there were certain situations. So, I mean, my parents kept what in the conservative movement they call kosher by ingredient. So, I mean, kosher meat, of course, from a kosher butcher and like all that kind of stuff. But Which is, you know, was the state of most of kosher, you know, in the 1950s. It was yes, certainly yes. the kosher that my Bubby and Zadie. The way my mother had grown up keeping kosher. Yeah. And so there came a time at which, for example, after I ate meat or while I was eating meat, I would not eat anything processed with it that was not marked as parv. So she would like buy a can of chickpeas to have with the chicken. And I would say, I'm not eating the chickpeas with the chicken because they're not hectured and just find me a can of OU chickpeas and I'll eat those instead. And, you know, those kinds of things. She wasn't thrilled with that initially. And so it was, it was very much that sort of practical stuff. And one thing she would often say to me is, but grandpa, meaning her father, grandpa who would eat that. And he uh -huh. was actually pretty traditional. And I remember one time she said to me, but grandpa ate swordfish. Oh, the great swordfish debate. 